This is the Chris Berry Show. Expert information on wealth, estate, and tax planning for the second half of life. Information that you can understand. Here's your host, Chris Berry. Welcome to the Chris Berry Show. Hope you had a great week. Uh, the show, just like every other week, we're going to start with a positive focus. Uh, something positive that happened the previous week. And uh, for me, it was a, a big week. I ended up turning the big four zero forty. So I had, had one of those milestone birthdays. Uh, and it was great coming in on a, a Monday uh, after my birthday on a Friday to the conference room. Uh, we have a team meeting every Monday. And the conference room, there's a bunch of uh, black balloons and decorations and uh, uh, a cake uh, uh, in black, everyone was dressed in black. Uh, <laughs> my, my team was basically kind of making fun that I, I was getting old. Uh, so that was fun. And then also personally, uh, my wife and I, we took a, a quick trip to uh, to Las Vegas. We watched a show. We had a, a really good restaurant uh, from one of the chefs that we've seen uh, on Chef's Table. I think Joel uh, Robachon. So we had a great dinner there. Uh, and uh, so just a quick little getaway to celebrate uh, turning uh, 40. So that was my positive focus. And today what we're going to do on the show is in our second segment, we're going to have Lois Ross. She's a elder care advisor, and she helps families kind of navigate the, the long-term care journey. Similar to what we do at our firm, uh, we help them kind of financially, legally, and from a tax perspective, uh, navigate the long-term care journey. But what Lois's role is, is that of helping families identify uh, the next step in terms of care. Uh, and a lot of times what that helps us do is once we know the next step in care, we can develop the financial and legal and tax plan on how best to pay for that care uh, that our individual needs. Uh, so that's going to be our second segment uh, with Lois Rost. Uh, she's a uh, elder care advisor uh, with Michigan Senior Resources. And then in our third segment, we're going to get into our listeners' questions and answers. So if you do have any questions that you want us to cover on the show, feel free to give us a call at 810-355-2584. So we're going to talk about some long-term care planning uh, strategies and, and navigating the long-term care journey. And if you want some more information on this, uh, one of the things that we'll do this week is if you're interested in learning more, I actually wrote a book called The Caregiver's Legal Guide for Planning for a Loved One with Chronic Illness, where we talk about the elder care journey and how best to pay for care. And so for the first five listeners that either call in or email, we'll send out a free copy of that book, Caregiver's Legal Guide to Caring for a Loved One with Chronic Illness. Uh, if you don't want a free copy and you want to pay for it, you're more than welcome to. It's on Amazon. It goes for about $15. But for the first five callers at 810-355-2584, or if you email us at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com, uh, if you leave us your name and address, we'll send you a free copy of that book uh, that n helps families navigate the long-term care journey, understanding the different options between home care, assisted living, how to pay for long-term care, uh, the six ways to pay for long-term care, which includes private paying, kids paying, uh, long-term care insurance, Medicare, um, Medicaid, as well as veterans benefits. So if you do want a free copy of that book for the first five callers, 810-355-2584, or if you email us at askchris at thechrisberryshow.com, we'll get that information out to you. And then I guess I have another positive focus uh, as well, I, I just remembered. So a couple weeks ago, uh, National Business Institute, which puts on continued education for uh, attorneys and CPAs and financial advisors, uh, I was presenting in Lansing on, uh, uh, well, I actually had two presentations. One, I was in Lansing talking about qualifying for Medicaid. And then also uh, that same week, they asked me to do a national webinar presenting on the use of trusts in the form of long-term care planning uh, and qualifying for veterans benefits and Medicaid. And I guess it, it went so well that they're looking to uh, fly me out for an eight-hour continued education. Uh, they're going to record it in uh, Minneapolis, uh, where it's going to be a national continued education uh, workshop for attorneys and financial planners and CPAs. So I was pretty excited that 
the presentation, uh, continued education went so well. The the feedback was so good that they uh, are bringing me back for more. So so that's always exciting to know that that we're doing good work out there. Um, and I think it's important to bring that up because uh, not that this area that we're practicing on is unique, but uh, more and more uh, families are realizing that they need more than just estate planning because estate planning is planning for what happens when you pass away. Uh, really, what we're planning for is planning for the second half of life. What happens if you don't pass away? And so what we're really focusing on at our firm is ensuring that the family's money lasts as long as the family does. I want to make sure that your money lasts as long as, as you do. And it sounds silly to think about, but it's a relatively new concept. And, and really one of the biggest concerns a lot of my families have is this question regarding long-term care. Uh, so that's why we're, we're having Lois Ross on today talking about how to receive the best type of care possible. Uh, but one of the things that really makes our firm unique is that we really do help families uh, take into account and protect against things like long-term care costs. And I'm always surprised, and when I talk to other people, uh, when I sit down with families and, and they ask, well, why didn't my financial planner, or why didn't my attorney talk to me about these things? Uh, you have to understand that these, these areas, are, they're slow, slow to move. And for whatever reason, uh, I started foc focusing on this early in my practice. And so uh, some of the things that we talk about on the show, some of the things that we talk about in the workshop, some of the ways that we help families, for some reason, uh, not every advisor, not every attorney is, is on board with this yet. And I think more and more uh, professionals are. Uh, for example, uh, when I was in law school, they didn't even offer an elder law class. So I had to see it in, in the States, I think, as a second-year law student, but there wasn't an elder law class. And so I actually uh, approached uh, Cooley Law School to uh, teach uh, a class on elder law because they didn't have one. And so uh, I am an adjunct professor where I'm teaching second- and third-year law students uh, this concept of not just planning for what happens when you die, but planning for what happens if you don't and you continue to age and face all the issues that go along with aging. And then just from a, a financial standpoint, uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, quote-unquote financial advisors out there who are uh, more working for a broker-dealer or a wirehouse where their job is to just sell uh, products or sell stocks or pitch you on the, on the latest uh, sector of the market. But not enough people are really talking about protecting against one of people's biggest concerns, and, and that's long-term care. And so today I thought I'd go over just some of the relatively unique options. Uh, and I say that in the sense that I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but it just seems like not enough people are talking about these options as it relates to long-term care. So when we're dealing with long-term care, we, we kind of have two approaches. One approach is we can plan ahead. And so that's where the earlier we start thinking about these things, the more options we have on the table. And so some of our planning ahead approaches involve setting up uh, special types of trusts. Uh, for example, we could set up what's called a castle trust, uh, which is a type of trust that not only avoids probate, controls the distribution, but can protect your assets from the devastating cost of nursing home care, which could easily run eight to $12,000 a month. And so what this castle trust does is it's a type of trust that you're in control, uh, you serve as trustee, you can change the beneficiaries, uh, but what it does is it starts a five-year race where once you move the assets into the trust, if you can make it five years, then 100% of the assets that are in the trust are protected from that nursing home or Medicaid spend down. And so what that means is we can have Medicaid pay that base level of care in a nursing home, but then we have a pot of resources available so that if we can access or if we need to, we can access that, those resources to improve our quality of life, to pay for additional services. Or if you're a married couple out there, if one spouse needs long-term care, then that healthy spouse can have the peace of mind to know that they're not going to be completely impoverished having to pay for that care. And that's an approach that we can use when we're planning ahead. Uh, likewise, we can also look at what we call asset-based long-term care strategies as well. And so we have some planning ahead approaches utilizing asset-based long-term care. And this is one of those things that I just don't think enough professionals are talking about. Uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll sit down with a family and they'll ask, well, why didn't my, my Edward Jones or my Morgan Stanley guy talk to me about this? And I think it's, it's because it, it's just a different approach. So let's look at this asset-based long-term care strategy. So one of the things we could do is let's say you have a lot of IRA money. 
or a 401k money. And so what makes that money unique is that it's what's called qualified money, uh, meaning there's a tax qualification to it. Uh, and if it is IRA or, or 401k and it's that traditional IRA money, then it's pre-tax, meaning you haven't paid any income tax on it. And so I sit down with a lot of families who uh, maybe someone worked for the, in the auto industry for Ford or, or GM, and, and they have l these large 401ks, large IRAs. Well, what happens if you were to have a stroke and need to pay for long-term care? Well, what would happen? Where would that money come from? Well, most likely one of those tax-deferred IRAs. So what could we do planning ahead to try to protect that money? Well, one of the things we could look at doing is what's called asset-based long-term care. And this is an example that we use in our workshops. And keep in mind, it's just a hypothetical. It's just an example. Uh, and if you do want some more information on this, uh, we do talk about it in our weekly workshops. And uh, coming up uh, April 17th in Ann Arbor, uh, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. in Ann Arbor at our Ann Arbor office, uh, we're going to have a, a workshop where we talk about these strategies. And then likewise in Livonia, Tuesday, April 16th at 10 a.m., uh, we're going to have one of our uh, workshops as well. And these workshops are free to the public. You do have to RSVP. So we're going to be in Livonia Tuesday, April 16th at 10 a.m., and then Wednesday in Ann Arbor, April 17th at 6 p.m., one of our rare evening uh, uh, workshops. So, uh, like I said, this is an example that we talk about in our workshop. So we have Tim and Patty. So Tim, uh, he worked for a GM for a number of years. He has an IRA valued at seven hundred thousand uh, dollars. They're in their mid sixties. Uh, he's recently retired. Uh, Betty, uh, she was a homemaker. Uh, between the two of them, in addition to Tim's seven hundred thousand dollar IRA. They also have some checking and savings of about $30,000, a home, and a small brokerage account. So if one of them were to have a stroke and need long-term care, where would that money come from? Well, most likely it would come out of Tim's IRA because that's where a majority of the wealth is. So the question is, how can we protect that? What can we do to leverage their assets so that if they were to need long-term care, they're going to be in a better position? Because we never know what, 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 what's going to happen. Looking into a crystal ball, we don't know what life is going to throw at us. So our goal with a lot of this is to try to keep our options open so that no matter what life throws at us, uh, we can play the, the best hand possible. So what could we do for, for Tim and, and Betty here? So one of the things we could look at doing is asset-based long-term care. And what we might be able to do is take a portion of Tim's $700,000 IRA, and keep in mind, you might have more money, you might have less, but we could take a portion of his IRA, let's say 250000 So we move it from one IRA to a new IRA, utilizing what's called the Pension Protection Act. And so by moving it from one IRA to the other IRA, we haven't triggered any tax. All we're doing is moving it from one pocket to another pocket. Because, but because this money is positioned in this new IRA, it could be leveraged so that if they were to need long-term care, it might be able to pay out $8,000 a month of long-term care benefits. So if either one of them, Tim or Betty, were to need long-term care, it could pay out maybe $8,000 a month for home care or assisted living or nursing home care. And then if both of them needed long-term care at the same time, it would pay out double. So it could pay out over $16,000 a month if they need long-term care. And then the question is, well, how long does that pay out? Well, that $250,000 could be leveraged, so now it pays out up to $430,000 worth of benefits. So we've turned that $250,000 into a $430,000 long-term care benefit. And then the question is, well, what happens if they were to pass away and not need any of those benefits? Is the money lost? Well, the nice thing about an option like this is that that long-term care benefit of four hundred and thirty dollars could also be a death benefit. So if both of them were to pass away peacefully in their sleep, instead of their beneficiaries getting $250,000, their beneficiaries could get the death benefit of $430,000. So what we've done is we've effectively turned that $250,000 into a long-term care or death benefit of $430,000. And again, this is just a hypothetical and it's based on their age and their health, but it's a way that we can leverage assets to pay for long-term care. 
And then if we don't need long-term care, then there could be a death benefit less left over. So it's a, a, typically it's a better alternative than that traditional long-term care insurance. Now, the question is, well, what happens if we already have a diagnosis of dementia or Parkinson's or something like that? Well, there's still asset-based strategies that we can utilize to try to leverage assets. So, for example, let's say we have someone that has uh, some assets and and one of the things we could do is, let's say they have $200,000 of IRA money. Well, what we could do is we could turn that into an income stream for the individual. Uh, and let's say that $200,000 pays out, and I'm just making up numbers here, $10,000 a, a year. Well, that $10,000 a year, if there are any, uh, uh, any activities of daily living, so uh, think of the first six things you do when you wake up. Uh, you get dressed, uh, um, you take your medications, you shower, uh, you cook a meal go to the bathroom, you transition out of bed. If you need assistance with those things, then that $10,000 a year, that income could double to $20,000. So again, it's just another way to leverage assets to help uh, protect against the devastating cost of long-term care. And those are just two of the potential strategies, or three, counting the Castle Trust as ways to address long-term care. And stay with us as we're going to bring in Lois Ross to talk about different types of care and how to find the best care. So our focus at our firm is finding legal and financial ways to pay for long-term care. And that's why we enjoy working with people like Lois to help them find the best care possible. And if you want more information on what we've talked about, I invite you to attend one of our workshops. We have them about once a week at one of our different locations. So join us as we continue the conversation. We bring Lois in. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm. He can help you, like he did Keith Gerard's family. Here's Keith. Basically, it's my in-laws. They're both 90, and uh, they can't live on their own or anything, and they don't have enough money to go in assisted living. We went to Chris Berry to get the VA benefits, and he said, well, we can get almost two grand a month, which they can put towards assisted living. It it was a big relief. Most lawyers are pretty sharp, but Chris, he knows exactly his business. And uh, it's a shame that these vets have to go through all these processes. But I guess we need people like Chris to help us out. He made it so easy for us. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The elder care firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Get the governmental benefits you deserve. The Elder Care Firm is ready to help you. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800. Welcome back. Very excited to have Lois Ross with Michigan Senior Resources here today. How are you doing, Lois? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. Great. Thanks. So, Lois, tell me a little bit about Michigan Senior Resources. Michigan Senior Resources is a free referral services that helps seniors and their families navigate through the senior living system. It's a very personalized service where we basically hold the family's hand through the whole process. Okay. And so when do families typically get in touch with you? In emergencies. Any type of... (laughs) What kind of emergencies? Usually the patient is in a rehab and the social worker is telling them that they have to be out in a couple days, so... um, They've, the social worker will give the family our information and call us, and then we work our magic. Okay. And how did you get into this? My grandmother had died um, quite a few years back, and yeah. I kind of missed her. And my son and I started by going to visit elderly people at assisted livings, and that was kind of how I began it. And then I started working in the industry as um, a marketer, um, say, um marketer, activity director, director at a couple of the large communities. And I started getting a lot of calls from families um, that were kind of confused at the type of facilities that we were working at. They would call and um, maybe the one that I was working at the last time um, was a memory care. Mm -hmm. And they would call and 
we would go, well, actually we would get the referral and then we would call them and they're like, well, mom doesn't even have memory care. Why are you calling us? So sure. I decided that after 20 something years of being in the industry that I had a lot that I could offer to families and I kind of knew the business like the back of my hand. So 11 years ago, I started my own company. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we make quite a few referrals to you. And I think your role is super important because families, it's a lot of times their first time going through this elder care journey. And it can be confusing uh, knowing the difference between home care and assisted living and, and that type of thing. So uh, let me ask you this. What, what services does an elder care advisor provide? So what we do is when a family contacts us, we'll go out to the um, rehab or wherever the patient might be. Mm-hmm. And we'll do an assessment on the patient, and then we'll sit down and have a conference with the family and kind of put together what are the best options and what are the care and memory, what fits them the best. Um, And then at that point, um, I basically automatically know at that point where they would be most appropriate because I know my communities and... I'm very particular about where I place people because, you know, not everybody fits one different community. You know, every community is different. Yeah. So what would be kind of the range or area that you're able to serve? I'm pretty much everywhere. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I'm mainly um, Oakland County, Wayne County, but I do um, Brighton. Um, I go out to Macomb. I go out to Ann Arbor. Okay. It just depends where the need is. Sure, yeah, so most of southeast Michigan, it sounds Right, like. yes. Okay. And so you mentioned sitting down with these families, and how do you know when it's time to maybe take the next step of needing assisted living? Well, it has a lot to do with the care that they might need. It has a lot to do with the memory and what's going on with the memory. Just um, recently, um, we had to put my mother in a memory care um, mm. and I I kind of saw what a good service I had because I had to do everything my family had no clue what to do so they were just so happy that you know I was able to facilitate everything but it was very very stressful so not only did I see it from the family side I also seen it from my side personally sure yeah and like I said, a lot of times it's family's first time going through this process, and so it's it's stressful not knowing what the next step is or, or the unknown. So we mentioned assisted living. What's the difference between independent care and assisted living? Well, independent living um, is usually for somebody who maybe um, is wanting to downsize um, from their home and maybe needs help with meals, housekeeping, laundry, stuff like that. Independent living says that they are um, assisted, some of them, which they do have a um, home care company there. So if the person needs help with showers or something, Mm. they can offer that. But assisted living, when you're going into assisted living, it's basically assistance with everything. And especially somebody that, you know, that's starting dementia, that's starting to wander and, you know, things like that, um, assisted living is good for them or somebody who has a lot of care needs. Mm -hmm. So that's where assisted living becomes good. Yeah. Now, how much do these places typically cost? Do you have any type of range that you could offer? They vary in range. Um, I work with um, different types of places. Um, mm-hmm. I, the bigger assisted livings can be anywhere from five to seven thousand mm-hmm. dollars a month. Um, independent living maybe averages between twenty-five and three thousand um, dollars. But I work a lot with the residential group homes, mm-hmm. um, which I find that eighty percent of the people I work with end up going to something like that because. They are less, they're more affordable. The price is all inclusive. There isn't any extras. Um, the care sometimes, for, especially for somebody who needs a lot of care, um, instead of being in a larger community where there's some, you know, not much staff to resident mm-hmm. ratio, in a group home there's like one or two staff to six residents. So if you have to go to the bathroom, you don't have to ring a bell and wait for 20 minutes for mm. somebody to come and take you to the bathroom. Yeah, and I, I think that's an important point is differentiate that there's more than just assisted living or independent living or these companies that do a lot of advertising that, that like, everyone knows their names. 
Um, talk to me a little bit more about how you find these small group homes. I get contacted all the time. My name is out there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what I do is when I find them, I go out there, I get to know the person who owns it because for me, that person is the one that sets the tone for the home and the care, and that's the person I kind of trust. Um, there's different levels. There's some that, you know, may be higher, you know, amounts in different areas and stuff. Um, but I get calls all the time, and if I don't, um, I will go on the Michigan State website and go through the licensing and, you know, contact homes there and mm. set up appointments to go out and do visits with them. Yeah, and I, I think it's so valuable, the service that you offer with that respect. Um, I've toured a lot of the bigger assisted livings and independent livings and, and nursing homes, but uh, my role in advising clients, I don't have time to visit every group home that pops up and I don't know the good ones from the bad ones so having someone like you to provide that valuable resource because a lot of times like you said it can be a, a much more service at much less cost but I, I think there's kind of finding the diamonds in the rough I don't know the good ones from the bad ones out there and that's really a, a, where I view your services your boots on the ground knowing these different communities right yeah it's it's important too to know them because like I said before not Everybody fits into every home. Not everybody fits into every assisted living. There's some that, you know, have just men, some that have just women, some that have more people with memory care, some, you know, the person people might be a little younger because mm -hmm. now I'm getting a lot of people in their late 60s and 70s. So, mm -hmm. you know, each home has a different type of clientele, and that's important because you can't just stick in... 80 year old dementia lady in a place where people you know are still high functioning and moving mm -hmm. around yeah and so you mentioned the cost of maybe assisted living at the the bigger names being five to eight thousand dollars a month what's available for people that might not be able to afford that that would be the residential group homes yeah. and what i do is i when i get with the family i find out the care needs i find out where they live you know things like that and then I'll go back to the homes that, you know, I know that I trust, and I'll mm. negotiate a price for the family. Mm. So, you know, I, I try to do the best for the family, you know. So if they have, like, $3,000, I'll go to my homes that take a little less money and mm. basically tell them, you know, this is what's going on. Are you guys willing to take this person for $3,000? Because if not, I'm not going to waste their time nor the family's time. Right, yeah. And I know the difference, but and even some of the things you've mentioned already, uh, maybe you could differentiate what you're able to provide versus a lot of people have heard of A Place for Mom, which they've done advertising, and I think Joan Rivers is a spokesperson. Uh, a lot of people kind of think uh, A Place for Mom is a way to find a good uh, independent or assisted living or the next step. Maybe differentiate what you're able to provide versus a service like that. Well, I feel as though um, a place for moms, sometimes they get a lot of referrals off the Internet, so they don't really get to personally know, you know, each person. Mm -hmm. Me, I've got so much experience. I have it family-wise. I have it um, business-wise. And, you know, I, I just know what is the most appropriate, and I don't feel that sending referrals out to 10 different communities is mm -hmm. going to help my people. I think that holding their hand and personally taking them to the communities and before I've already spoke with the community before I've even brought them there. So I think it's more appropriate what I do is just, you know, making sure I know personally the family and the resident and, sure. and taking them to the right places. Yeah, and what I found uh, when some of my clients have used a service similar to that is then they get bombarded by people chasing them and whether it's a right fit or not, uh, it's just this shotgun approach of now they're, it almost creates more stress because they don't know which direction uh, to go versus, uh, l let me ask you this, would you say that your service is a lot more individualized? Definitely individualized. And I, I pride myself in not bugging people. You know, I kind of will take them to different places and make a few callbacks, and if they're not interested, you know, then I'm not going to bug them because... I worked in the big community, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for a lot of families, that's the last thing they need is, is someone nagging them, bugging them, or, or trying to get them to move forward before the time's right, right. versus uh, I think a lot of times they need hand-holding. And while we can help them kind of navigate the, the financial and legal journey, 
uh, service like what you provide is probably the most important because that's really determining the type of care that they're going to receive. Right. Yeah. Um, so now this sounds great, but how much does it cost to utilize your services for these families? We're a free referral service, um, and how we work is that we have contracts with all the communities, and not just a couple of them, but all the homes that we work with, we have contracts that, with them. So we get a referral fee from the contract or mm. from the homes. So that's how we're able to provide our service for free. Yeah. And when I'm sitting down with clients and, and making the recommendation, they, they just love that idea that there's someone there holding their hand who's willing to um, kind of cut down their choices in the sense that a lot of these services, they're, they end up being overwhelmed by having too many choices. But by just being able to relieve their stress of, of cutting out those choices uh, to the ones that really apply to their situation. A lot of families, just you can see the, the peace of mind they get from that. Um, so how do you help them with all these different assisted livings and group homes and independent living options that are popping up, uh, especially even in like the Canton Nova area? You can't drive a, a mile without seeing new assisted living popping up, it seems like. How do you help these families narrow down these choices to find the right community that's right for them? Well, somehow, like I said, I, I kind of know it like the back of my hand. It doesn't, you know, take much just getting to know the family and mm -hmm. the patient. And um, I narrow it down to two places, sometimes three, because I just feel that, you know, I've been doing this for so long and I've helped so many families and just you know, knowing, you know, everything about them. I'm able to narrow it down and help them in probably 95% of the time it works. Sometimes it doesn't, but yeah. most of the time it does. Yeah, and I think it's important that it does work because a lot of times, especially in when we're dealing with vulnerable seniors, the transitions are difficult. So you don't want a lot of different moves of, uh, oops, we made the wrong choice, and now we, mom's been there for... Uh, two months now we need to move her to a, a, another location. So I think trying to nail it, getting it right the first time is, is super important. Right. Well, like I said, personally, I had to help with my mother. And so now it's, it's very personal to me. And mm -hmm. I try to look at if this was my family member, um, would I put them in this place? Some places are less expensive and not as nice as other places because people don't, and the people don't have that much money. But I know the care is good, and to me, the care is the most important. Yeah. And along those lines, maybe help us out. What are the factors that you look at in helping families kind of match them to the right community? Uh, obviously, care is the most important, but um, uh, budget has to fit into this as well. And what are the other factors that you look at? Well, it's the budget. It's the medical needs. Well, that's the care portion. Right. It's the area where, you know, the family, like... Sometimes I have somebody who lives in Port Huron and somebody right. who lives in Farmington. And so it's trying to find the right place and that, you know, is easy for the families to get to. Um, how it looks, you know, you just sure. know different families, how yeah. what they're, you know, expecting. I, I just, like I say, a lot of it is just so automatic to me. I don't even think about it anymore. Right. I just automatically know it. Yeah, it's one of those things where you've, you've done it put in the 10,000 hours and, and you just kind of know it. So, Lois, if someone wants to get a hold of you or, or has questions or maybe they have a family member that needs to take the next step, what's the best way to reach you? My phone, um, my phone number is 734-765-5312 um, or by email, it's Lois, L-O-Y-C-E, at mi dash SeniorResources.com. Well, Lois, thank you so much for being part of the show. We'll make sure to have that information in our show notes. One more time, what's the best number to reach you at if they have a question? 734-765-5312. All right. Thank you so much. This has been uh, a conversation with Lois uh, Ross of Michigan Senior Resources. Join us after the break. Thank you. The cost of care for an elderly loved one or a loved one with a chronic illness is shockingly expensive. If you are dealing with the unbelievable cost of care, make sure you get all the benefits you're entitled to. Here's certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm in Brighton. Most of my clients are, are really concerned about long-term care costs. They don't know where to turn. And what we can do is put together legal strategies to protect your resources 
and also bring in additional resources to help pay that cost of care. One of the things that they often say is that I, I wish I knew about this years prior. And unfortunately, the information is out there, but there's just so few certified elder law attorneys. As the only certified elder law attorney in Livingston County, it's my job to make sure that our seniors, our loved ones, our veterans have the best quality of care possible and the best quality of life possible. Protect your hard-earned assets from probate, long-term care costs, and the IRS. The elder care firm will get you the government mental benefits you deserve, including veterans benefits and Medicaid. Visit theeldercarefirm.com and schedule a free 15-minute phone consultation. That's theeldercarefirm.com. Welcome back to the Chris Berry Show. So hopefully you enjoyed that conversation with Lois as she went over the elder care journey and the different types of care and how best to ensure that you're able to find the best type of care for a loved one. So in our first segment, uh, we covered some long-term care cost uh, strategies, how to minimize some of those costs using either uh, a castle trust to protect against the devastating cost of long-term care in a nursing home. And then we outlined two asset-based long-term care strategies, one utilizing maybe pre-tax dollars uh, where we're planning ahead, and then another strategy uh, also that could be utilizing pre-tax dollars, but now more of a crisis situation that really has uh, zero underwriting uh, involved, where we can turn on an income stream for an individual, and then if that individual needs any type of long-term care, that income stream could double for the monthly benefits. So keep in mind that there, there's always options, uh, even if you have a loved one that already has a, a diagnosis. And if you want some more information on some of our planning uh, strategies, then you can attend one of our workshops. Uh, we have workshops coming up in Livonia and Ann Arbor this month or this upcoming week. So uh, in Livonia on Tuesday, April 16th at 10 a.m., and then in Ann Arbor uh, on Wednesday, April 17th at 6 p.m. And these are at our satellite offices. So we do have satellite offices at these different locations. And we try to limit uh, the number of people in these workshops to no more than 20 or so. So if you are interested, uh, make sure to give us a call at 810-355-2584. Or you can click through to our website, thechrisberryshow.com. And there's some uh, information where you can register right there on online by uh, clicking through, going to our workshop registration page. Then you drop down to where it says attendance and it'll have our uh, different workshops where you can uh, register online. So space is limited for those. Now what we're going to do is get into some questions and answers. So these are questions submitted by our listeners. And if you do want to submit a question, you can uh, via the phone at 810-355-2584. Give us a call or uh, email us at askchris at com, or rate on our website, thechrisberryshow.com. You can uh, submit a, a question there. And then also remember this week uh, for the first five callers or emailers, uh, if you provide your name and address, we'll send out uh, free of charge uh, a copy of a book we wrote in 2014 called The Caregiver's Legal Guide to Planning for a Loved One with Chronic Illness. Provide some good guidance on navigating this uh, long-term care journey and how to utilize these different resources to pay for long-term care. Again, just email us or give us a call if you do want a a copy of that, limited to the first five people. Now, uh, as with most of our shows, we're going to get into some of the questions and answers, questions submitted from our listeners. So the first question is, where should I invest my Social Security money to save on taxes? And this is from Don. I work full-time earning uh, over 90000 a year. My wife also works full-time. Where should I invest the Social Security money to save money on taxes? So it sounds like we've already claimed Social Security. And uh, without knowing more, I can't really advise you uh, directly, but I'll, gi- I'll just give you some general advice. So uh, the first thing with Social Security is if you start working prior to full retirement age, you can actually get a reduction in benefits depending on how much Uh, income you have coming in from your work, where you can actually reduce the amount of Social Security you get. And then once you reach full retirement age, which is either 66 or 67, depending on when you're born, then you can continue working with no reduction of your benefits. But there could be a reduction, or not a reduction, but still your Social Security could be taxed. 
So, uh, and also your Social Security could be taxed if you take it prior to full retirement age. And basically what happens is that there's an analysis that's done to determine how much of your Social Security will get taxed, uh, regardless of whether you take Social Security early or after full retirement age. So full retirement age is important because if you take Social Security prior to that and you're working, you could receive a reduction in benefits. If you take Social Security after full retirement age and continue working, there is no reduction in benefits, to be clear. But either way, your Social Security could get taxed. And basically what happens is that there's a calculation called provisional income that is done. So they look at the amount of provisional income. And your provisional income is basically your income. So let's say you're working, whatever your working income is, plus add on top of that half of what your Social Security would be. And that's going to be your provisional income. And if your provisional income is, uh, for a married couple, over about $44,000, then 85% of your Social Security will get taxed. Now, it's not an 85% tax on your Social Security. It means 85% of your Social Security will get taxed at whatever your personal income tax rate is. So again, if you make over roughly $44,000 a year in provisional income as a married couple, then 85% of your Social Security will get taxed at whatever your marginal tax rate is or your effective tax rate. So in Don's situation, uh, he's earning more than uh, $44,000. So what that's going to mean is that 85% of your Social Security will get taxed. So then his question is, where should I invest the Social Security money to save money on taxes? Well, unfortunately, once you receive this money from Social Security, uh, that money will be taxed. So then the question is, what do you do with that money uh, so that when it grows, that money can be taken out tax-free? Where that's where we have to look at our different types of accounts uh, and what we like to talk about is the order of money. So really, you have three different types of accounts or asset classes that you can invest in. Uh, one would be tax deferred. So that's where you take money uh, like an IRA or 401k. The money's never been taxed. And then when you take that money out, then you have to pay the tax. So it wouldn't make sense to do that with the Social Security money because it's already been taxed. Well, then that leaves you two options. One option is you can look at tax-free investments. So tax-free investments would be things that as you pull the money out, any of that growth would be tax-free. So this would be things like a Roth. Okay. Now, you might be limited on your Roth contributions. It sounds like you are working, so you'd be limited to contributing only, if you're over age 50, uh, $6,500 in a year to a Roth. So a Roth would be one option. A second option would be things like HSAs, health savings accounts, or um, 529 plans, which are educational accounts. So if you have any loved ones like grandkids or something, maybe you could set up a 529, uh, maybe a health savings account depending on, on your age. Uh, or another option, and I see a lot of clients going this route, is with money that they don't need from, say, Social Security, or uh, let's say you're taking out your required minimum distributions, you don't really need them. One of the things that you could do is you could put it into a, a form of investment or a form of uh, asset that grows tax-free um, and also has a long-term care benefit tied to it as well. So here we could look at things like index universal life insurance. Uh, where the money that you put into this, the cash value could grow tax-free. So when you pull that money from uh, the index universal life insurance policy, that money comes out tax-free. And then also that death benefit, which you might be less inclined or interested in uh, as you move into retirement, can also double as a long-term care benefit as well. Uh, so one of the strategies would be if you're looking to put more money into a tax-free uh, type of asset class and you're limited by your Roth contributions, maybe look at index universal life insurance as an alternative where the investment that you've put into it, the cash value can grow tax free. You pull the money out and you don't have to pay any income tax on it, but also it can double as a long-term care benefit. And also one of the nice things about an index universal life insurance policy is that you can have that 
the invested or ownership of that could be in a trust, such as a asset protection trust. Um, so it's a kind of advanced planning technique, uh, but it, it's a tricky little option that may make sense in certain situations. Now, you don't have to just look at tax-free category of investments or asset classes. You could also look at taxable asset classes. So this would be things like brokerage accounts, checking accounts, savings accounts, money markets, mutual funds, stocks, and bonds. So uh, you have this extra money coming in from Social Security, so you've already paid the income tax on it. So you can't, you're in, you wouldn't want to put it into a tax-deferred account like an IRA. So that leaves you with a tax-free option or a taxable option. Uh, advantage of the tax-free option is you've already paid the tax, and now you could have that grow tax-free so that when you pull it out, the money comes out tax-free. Uh, or you could look at a, a taxable option as well, depending on kind of the time frame of when you plan on using the money. Uh, if it's something that you're going to use sooner rather than later, then I might look at one of the taxable options, like a CD, checking account, savings account, money market, etc. But if this is money that maybe you've earmarked to use in the future that you want to grow a little bit more, then maybe look at one of the tax-free options, like a Roth or Index Universal Life Insurance Policy. So hopefully that was helpful, uh, Don, uh, with regards to where to invest your Social Security money to save on taxes. Uh, unfortunately, you do have to uh, pay the tax on that Social Security money uh, because you are over that provisional income allowance. Uh, so 85% of your Social Security will be taxed. Again, it's not an 85% on your Social Security. It's 85% of your Social Security will get taxed at your marginal tax rate. That brings us on to our next question. And our next question is, can a nursing home or Medicaid take away my home and land that my parents gave me? And this is from Vance. My father suffered a, from a stroke and his Medicare only covered 28 days of his nursing home, leaving us to pay $150 per day. I live in a house with my parents and two disabled children. If my parents get in debt and are unable to pay the nursing home bill, will they take the home and land that were given to me three years ago? So this is a complicated situation, Vance, uh, whenever we're dealing with governmental benefits. So things like Medicare and Medicaid and veterans benefits. And then on top of that, we have gift tax rules that we need to take into account. So based on the information, uh, it sounds like your father suffered a stroke, and a lot of people assume that you're going to have 100 days of Medicare. But keep in mind, to receive Medicare, you have to be participating in rehabilitation. And sometimes either the, the rehab may end because that was kind of the prognosis, or maybe you weren't participating in the rehab, or the rehab isn't helping you either maintain or improve, and you're continuing to get worse. Well, then what's going to happen is that you're not going to get your full 100 days of Medicare. Medicare can end sooner rather than later. So it sounds like in this situation, Medicare only covered 28 days. Then the next question is, how do you go about paying for long-term care, which in a nursing home could be eight to $12,000 a month? Well, one option is to private pay. Now, if you're private paying, that could easily be $300, $450 per day. And there's this governmental program called Medicaid that will help pay for that cost of care. But to qualify for Medicaid, a single individual can only have $2,000 worth of countable assets. A married couple, they're going to make you cut your assets in half. At most, you could have $120,000, where one spouse in the nursing home would be able to keep $2,000, the healthy spouse, they don't want to completely impoverish. The healthy spouse would be able to keep um, uh, half of the assets up to 120000 So I mentioned countable assets. Well, the home is an exempt asset. But it sounds like in this situation, Vance, that your parents, or father at least, uh, gifted the home to you, it looks like, three years ago. So my question is, how was that gift facilitated? Was it done through a deed? Uh, and then the question would be, what does the deed say? Does the deed say that it goes from dad's name to now it's completely in your name? Or did maybe dad do what's called a ladybird deed that says it's in his name while he's alive, and then when he passes away, it ends up going to you, thereby avoiding probate? The reason why this is such a big issue is because it sounds like this was done three years ago, and if it was a gift three years ago, Medicaid has a five-year look-back period where they look back five years to see if you moved any money around or if you've gifted away assets. 
And then if they have, they could potentially penalize you for that gift. Even though the home is an exempt asset, that was still a gift and you could be penalized or your dad could be penalized for that. So if that's the case, then you're left with basically two options. Uh, one option is that maybe we give the home back to dad because while it's in dad's name, it's an exempt asset. And then we do what's called a ladybird deed that says it remains in dad's name while he's alive. So it's exempt. And then when dad passes away uh, with that ladybird deed, it acts like a beneficiary designation. So upon dad's death, it avoids probate, which is important, and then also avoids a state recovery. And what a state recovery says is the state of Michigan can place a lien on your home or any assets that end up in probate upon death uh, to help pay off that, that Medicaid debt. So to avoid a state recovery as we have it right now in Michigan, one of the things we can do is a ladybird deed that says it's in your name while you're alive or your dad's name while he's alive, and then upon death avoids probate, avoids a state recovery, and goes to whoever the name beneficiary is. So that might be one option, Vance, is that we fix the deed, put it back in dad's name, and do a ladybird deed. Now, the other option is, what if dad had just listed your name maybe jointly? Uh, so maybe it wasn't necessarily a completed gift. Well, if that's the case, then uh, the home may still be exempt during dad's life, and it may not have uh, triggered that, that gift issue, that look-back period. Uh, so that that could be uh, an option as well. Uh, the important thing would be really to see what that deed actually says. If it was a completed gift to you, or if it was done through joint ownership, or if it was a ladybird deed. But what this question really brings up is just how complicated planning for the second half of life can be. And that's really what we help our clients and we help uh, the public through our workshops. So if you do want more information on our workshops, uh, visit our website, thechrisberryshow.com. And I want to thank everyone for listening to us this week. Hopefully you enjoyed the interview with uh, Lois Ross and learn more about the elder care journey. Make it a great week. Talk to you next week. Learn more about Chris Berry and how he can help your family by visiting online at thechrisberryshow.com. That's thechrisberryshow.com. You can also call Chris Berry at 810-355-2584. That's 810-355-2584. This program content reflects the opinions of Chris Berry and his guests, not the elder care firm, Prosperity Capital Advisors, or the C.J. Berry Group, and is subject to change at any time without notice. Content provided herein is for informational purposes only and should not be used or construed as investment or legal advice or a recommendation regarding the purchase or sale of any security or to follow any legal or tax strategy. There's no guarantee that the strategist's statements, opinions, or forecasts provided herein will prove to be correct. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. Indices are not available for direct investment. Any investor who attempts to mimic the performance of an index would incur fees and expenses which would reduce returns. All investing involves risk, including the potential for loss of principal. There's no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. We recommend that you consult with a professional dedicated to your needs. This program is furnished by the Elder Care Firm. If you or a loved one is facing long-term care costs, make sure you talk with certified elder law attorney Chris Berry from the Elder Care Firm, like Sherry Skelton and her family did from Fenton. My mother has Alzheimer's. My mom just had a regular will. She didn't have anything set up in a trust. And Chris set up a brand new will, and he got everything rolling. Chris has been extremely helpful. My mom would never have gotten my dad's VA benefits if it wasn't for them. Lori, who actually did a lot of the paperwork for the VA. She was like my new best friend. I talked to her probably two, three times a week, and we would be on hold together while we were waiting for the VA to pick up. Uh, we were approved, and we would never would have been able to do that if it wasn't for them. I can't even begin to tell you what he did for my family. Hello, I'm attorney Chris Berry. The Elder Care Firm is here to help you and your family find solutions. Call us today. Protect your assets from probate, long-term care costs, the IRS, and get the governmental benefits you deserve. Visit theeldercarefirm.com today or call 810-214-3800.